Hi guys, today we are going to learn about the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's look at this problem. We have that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 1 to x t squared dt is going to be equal to what? Well, the first thing that we need to do here, it will be integrate the inside, meaning the t squared dt. Okay, so if we do that, we have that the derivative with respect to x of, and that's going to be t cubed divided by 3, and we're going to evaluate this uh, from 1 to x. With this being said, I'm going to um, plug my x and my 1, having x cubed divided by 3 minus 1 over 3. Okay? So at this point, you are like, I can take the derivative of each of these terms. I take the derivative of the first term, and I have x squared. And I take the derivative of the second term, and I have that that's 0. So let's look at the relationship between this one and this one. So I see the t squared, and I see the x squared. Mm, something must be connecting here, because they are kind of like the same as the inside. Let's see if with another example we can see the trend. So over here we're going to pretty much do the same. The same by taking the integral of cosine of t dt first, then evaluate, and then the, take the derivative, okay? So with that being said, we have d dx, and then you have that the integral of cosine, you know that it's going to be sine of t, evaluated from pi over 6 to x. With this being said, now you plug the x and the pi over 6, and you have that this is the derivative with respect to x of sine of x minus sine of pi over 6. And now we're going to take the derivative of each of these terms. The derivative of sine of x is going to be cosine of x, and the derivative of sine of pi over 6, that's a constant, therefore that's 0. So let's look at, again, the beginning and the end of our problem. I see that the cosines, they are pretty much the same. So what this is telling you? This is telling you that pretty much we can have kind of like a shortcut. And that's the theorem that we're going to learn today, the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So what it's telling you, if f is a continuous function on an open interval i that contains a, please note that a is a constant in this situation, then for every x in the interval, we have that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x, f of t dt is going to be equal to f of x. That's what you are seeing here with the cosine and here with the t square. Okay? Uh, so, this is the second fundamental theorem of calculus and it's super powerful. It seems very simple, but it's very powerful. So, let's look at another example here. What happens if my x, instead of being on the upper bound, it's in the lower bound? So the first thing that I need to do is to make sure that the x is here as an upper bound. To make that, we are going to put the negative in front so we can flip the order of my integral. This is because you know your properties of integrals pretty well. Okay? So at this point, you are like, well, this looks exactly as we want it. Okay, so at this point, you need to respect the negative, and you can use the second fundamental theorem of calculus saying that this is negative x squared. And that's happening because you have it here. Okay, so summarizing what we have and overgeneralizing the situation, we have that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from x to a, f of t dt is going to be equal to negative f of x. Okay, that's what we just discovered over here. Now, let's complicate things a little bit more. What happens if your limit of integration here, instead of being the clean x, is going to be x squared? So you have the derivative with respect to x of the integral from pi over 6 to x squared cosine of t dt. And here, what it bothers me here, the first time that I see it, is that this x is not a clean x. It has a square. So since I'm not sure, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way, meaning taking the integral, evaluating, and then taking the derivative and see if we have a trend. So we have the derivative with respect to x, and you know that the integral of cosine is going to be sine of t. Okay, and we're going to evaluate that from pi over 6 to x squared. Then you evaluate, you plug your x squared and your pi over 6, having the derivative of sine 
of x squared minus sine of pi over 6. Okay, so at this point you are like, okay, so this one is going to be cosine of x squared times the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. Okay, and we know this because of the chain rule. Okay, now what happens with this one? This one is zero because this is a constant. Okay, so this happens because your best friend, the chain rule. Okay, so remember that this is happening here. So how can I overgeneralize this beautiful conclusion that we have here? Well, we have kind of like the same situation as before, but we have it multiplied times the derivative of the inside. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus, the chain rule version, tells you that if f is continuous on an open interval i containing a and g of x is a differentiable function of x when g of x belongs to that interval, then for every x such that g of x is in the interval, we have that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to g of x, f of t dt, is going to be equal to f of g of x times g prime of x. Okay, so pretty much here we have the same as before, but we are adding the super powerful chain rule. Okay, so please note that we have this here. Now, when are we going to use this? We're going to use this every time that you see that the x is not alone here, meaning that it looks like a function, one of the limits of integrations. Okay, um, so let's look at more examples here. If we want to use the second fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate the following, what are you going to do here? Well, here I see that my x is alone, meaning I don't need the chain rule. Or if I do, I can see that the derivative of the x is 1. So pretty much I don't need the chain rule, okay? So this one, by second fundamental theorem of calculus, you have that it's going to be the square root of 1 plus x squared. And that's going to be it for this one. For part B, what you have is that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 2 to x tangent of t cubed dt, that's going to be equal to what? Look at here, again, the limit of integration. Your x, again, is lonely. Therefore, your uh, situation does not have a chain rule. So you have tangent of x cubed, and that's it. If you want to see the chain rule, it would be times 1 here because your g of x is x, okay? Uh, so that's what we have for these two problems. For this problem, what we have is the derivative with respect to x of the integral from negative 1 to x cubed. So uh, of 1 over 1 plus t dt. So what are you going to do here? Well, what you can recognize is that your g of x is going to be this guy. So you have that g of x is going to be equal to x cubed and then uh, your situation here uh, pretty much is the chain rule version of the second fundamental theorem of calculus having 1 over uh, 1 plus x cubed times and then you have the derivative of your g of x which is 3x squared. Uh, of course you can uh, write this all nice and tidy as 3x squared everything divided by 1 plus x cubed and that's pretty much what you have for this problem. Okay. Um, also, you can have that x, the limit of integration, as sine, tangent, cos, co, tangent, cos, sine, whatever, right? So you have that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 2 to sine of x of the cube root of 1 plus t squared dt is going to be equal to what? Again, you spot that this is going to be the chain rule version, having your g of x to be sine of x, okay? Once you recognize that, you pretty much plug this situation here. So you have that that's going to be equal to the cube root of 1 plus sine square of x. And everything is going to be times what the derivative of sine of x, which you know that it's going to be cosine of x. And that's pretty much what we have for this problem, okay? Uh, so that's it. Okay, so because you have the chain rule over here. I mean, you can take out the parentheses, but that doesn't uh, make any difference. Okay, so let's look, at, let's look at this next problem that we have over here. You have the graph of a function f consists of a quarter of a circle 
and line segments, specifically three line segments, this one, this one, and this one, okay? Let g be the function given by g of x is equal to the integral from 0 to x f of x dx. So what I have here is the relationship between g and f. And what function are they sharing with you? They are sharing f. You know that f from the definition of uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, you know that this is going to be g prime. Okay, that's the relationship that you have here. Okay, uh, so with that being said, what are you going to do? Well, first they ask you to find g of zero. Okay, so g of zero, you know that it's going to be equal to you plug the zero here and here, having an integral from zero to zero f of t dt. Properties of integrals, they tell you that if you have the same limit of integration, your area is going to be zero. And that's what we have for this problem. For the second part of the problem, you have g of negative one. g of negative one, what you're going to do is you are going to plug it here. So you have from zero to negative one f of t dt. But as soon as I write it down, I'm like, this looks iffy because the upper limit of integration is less than this one. So I'm going to flip it, okay? So if we flip it, what happens? You have negative, and then I have my negative one, the zero, f of t dt. Now, what are you going to be looking at in your graph? Well, we're looking at the area, okay, from negative one to zero of this figure, okay? So that area that you see over here, let me draw it, from negative one to zero is, this one that you see here, okay? So that's the triangle that you are seeing here. That's this guy, okay? So with that being said, what's going to be that? Well, that's going to be one half times one times two, which is one, but you have a negative in front, so that's going to be negative one. And you might tell me why it's negative. It's above the x-axis. The problem is that we have the negative because we flip the sign. So it's going to be negative even though it looks positive on the graph. Okay? Now, what do you have for g of 2? g of 2 is pretty similar to the previous 2. What it's going to change is that you have that it's from 0 to 2, which it looks nice. f of t dt. So what area are you going to be looking at for this guy, for this guy, what you see is that you're going to look from zero to two, okay? So the area that we're going to look at in this situation is that, that quarter of a circle that you see there. Do you know how to compute the area of a quarter of a circle? I think so. That's going to be one fourth, okay, times pi r squared. What's the radius of that circle? Two squared. So this is going to be just pi. And it makes sense that it's positive because it's above the x-axis, okay? In addition, we didn't manipulate here my integral, so it's just the natural pi there, okay? And last but not least, we have g of 5 that you can imagine that it's going to be pretty similar. So it's going to be the integral from 0 to 5 f of t dt. So what are you going to look here at? Well, this one is a little bit more, right? So this one, it's going to be from here to here. Okay, so it's going to include everything, this one as well, okay, so that one, and this one too, okay, uh, so you have a lot there, okay, uh, so I'm running here out of uh, marker, so let me just throw it away, but that's the part that you have, okay, and this is this, okay, so let me just throw it away, okay, so you have that it's going to be pi, and you're going to tell me how in the world you expect us to compute this. Well, this, I'm seeing a triangle here, a rectangle over here, and another triangle here. They are negative because they are below the x-axis. This triangle is going to be the area negative 1 because it's going to be 1 half base 1 times height, which is 2. So that's a 1 negative because it's below the x-axis. This rectangle, you know that it's base times height, which is 2, okay? Negative because it's below the x-axis. And this one over here, the last triangle that we have there, it's also going to be negative 1. Combine the like terms so you have pi minus 4. And that's, that's it for this one, okay? Uh, so you have this situation, cool? So this one, you can see that it's actually going to be negative because uh, pi is less than negative 4. Okay, well, uh, pi is uh, 
less than 4 and 4 is negative. Okay, so find all the values of x on the open interval negative 1 to 5 at which g has a relative maximum justify your answer. So what are you going to do? I'm going to look at this interval. So this interval starts here and ends here. Okay, so negative 1 and 5. Okay, so this is where our eyes are going to be looking at. Now, how do we know that there's a relative maximum? A relative maximum exists, okay, when the derivative changes from uh, positive to negative. So, where that's happening, g prime is changing from positive to negative only at one point, and that point is 2. So, let's justify it here. So, g, okay, uh, has a relative max, okay, at x equals 2 because what's going on there? You know that f, which is equal to g prime, okay, changes uh, from positive to negative there, okay? Please note something that it's super important when you are justifying your answer. This f needs to appear because that's what I'm giving you. I'm not giving you g prime, I'm giving you f. So in your conclusion, you need to write what I'm giving to you and what basically I'm asking, which is the g, okay? So uh, just remember that, okay? Let's move on to c. Find the absolute minimum value of g, okay, on the interval negative 1, 5, and the value of x at which it occurs, justify your answer. Please note that they are only asking for the x, not the point. This absolute screams extreme value theorem, okay? As soon as I see the absolute, and moreover, you have here the closed interval, this is just like a straight um, extreme value theorem uh, problem, okay? So with that being said, you have that the x, you have the g of x, and then you have your extremes, which are negative 1 and 5. Moreover, we already know a lot about this function. And the situation is that you know that this is going to be a critical number, okay? And any critical number is going to be when your derivative is equal to 0 or undefined, okay? So you can see that that happens at this extreme and here, okay? So I'm going to put the 2 here, okay? Do you already have the values of this situation? You do. Where? you have them here, okay? So we can easily just copy this ones, okay? I'm just going to pretty much copy them here. So you have negative one, pi, pi minus four, and compare them. Which one is the smallest one? The smallest one is the negative one of the g of x's, okay? So you have that that's your minimum. So let's conclude by the extreme value theorem, okay? the absolute ma minimum, okay, of g is, okay, uh, on the interval, excuse me, let me, uh, I wanted to conclude early, but no, okay, uh, the absolute minimum of, of e on the interval negative 1, 5, okay, uh, occurs, okay, at x equals negative 1. Okay, and that's it for this problem. We justify it via our beautiful extreme value theorem. Okay, so the next one that we have is find the x coordinate of each point of inflection of the graph. And here you have that the graph is going to be uh, of g uh, from negative 1 to 5. What are we going to do here? What we want to find here is where my graph of g prime is uh, changing from increasing to decreasing. So as you can see here, it's increasing then decreases, okay? Or vice versa, right? So you know that this one is going to be an inflection point, okay? Let's keep analyzing my graph. This one, okay, so this one doesn't change because it's decreasing and decreasing, okay? But here it changes from decreasing to increasing. So this is another inflection point. Okay, so you have two inflection points, okay? X equals zero and X equals three, okay? Uh, so let's conclude, okay? The most important part now that we have our solution is actually concluding, okay? So since 
okay? You know that uh, F, which is equal to G prime, okay? Um, is equal to that one, okay? Uh, changes, okay? Um, from, let's start with the zero, okay? From increasing to uh, decreasing, um, or vice versa, remember that you can do that, or vice uh, versa at x equals zero and x equals three, okay? Um, G has a uh, an inflection point. There. And that's uh, pretty much it for this question. I hope that you find this video helpful. Bye.